you're going to be you're going to be I'm going to say entertained. Hopefully you'll be entertained as well as uh, to learn something a lot from from Joe's presentation. This is Joe Passmore, double All Ireland winning coach with Owen Rua in uh, Korean. You've probably heard of that club, a very successful club uh, in, in football and across the sports and everything. Well, the games. Yeah. Joe, we. I don't know here if you've got this information or not, so I apologise if you need to they already know. Joe will be looking at different methods of coaching employed to develop the female athlete. You know, drawing his vast experience at the <coughs> club level and moulding them into winning teams. And he's currently managing for all, he's doing a whole lot of roles. He's working with the uh, University of Ulster Korean senior team. Is that right, Joe? Uh, Berlin team. Berlin team. So, I'm sure, well, I'm looking forward to learning a bit from him anyway, and I'm sure we'll all gain something from uh, listening to Joe. Okay, Joe. Okay, thanks. Over to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I suppose, uh, Jane said it all in the intro there. Um, my background um, is a number of other old. I've come for over recently, I've lived in Derry since 1993. Um, um, and what I say today is entirely my own, own opinion. Okay, so it's based on my experience of working with um, uh, in particular our Kobe team. That's why I was asked to speak here. Mary O'Connor, I think, was originally earmarked, but Mary had something else on. Mary O'Connor, you would have got a girl who's won six or seven on Ireland medals in Kobe and two or three in football. So, you know. Anyhow, um, the, the content today is really in two parts. First of all, I'm going to talk about my view about how you deal with female athletes, how you work with them. Um, is there any difference between dealing with female athletes and fellas? Or are you basically talking about coaching an athlete? Um, okay. And on the second part, um, I'm going to look at some statistical analysis. I know it all sounds very boring, but last year um, I was privileged to be involved with the Ulster Kimobi team in the Gale. I was coached to the team and we lost by a point to Munster. Um, so I'm going to go through some of the match data from that to show you the level of intensity that the girls were operating at. And if any of you were up at the session with Kevin and uh, Mickey Wing did, there's some interesting comparisons between the distance, for example, that the girls covered in our match and the, the distances that some of the hurlers were um, covering. And I some of the surprise to me. But I'm not well surprised, but you know, when we think about it, it's, it's, it's not surprising where they're coming from. Okay, so I'm going to go through this. and. Some of this is my own personal experience. I'm going to talk about players. Um, some of the players will identify, some of them won't. Um, just, um, okay. So first of all, a um, couple of quotes that I uh, kind of love by. In the midst of winter, I finally learned that when there was a bit of an invincible summer. Um, in 2009, I've been involved with the Wonder Kimogi team since uh, 2007. The previous year, they won the Intermediate Championship for the first time. And the then management team went off the managed area. We had no management team in place. I was asked to step in to take the team for a game or two. Um, and I was then approached by one of the players who was on the dairy squad who said, will you take us to the championship? Um, so I agreed to do it. I was taking our senior hurlers at the time, and I agreed to do it. And my perception of coaching women and uh, Kimogi was kind of very stereotypical. I, I didn't know a lot about it. Even if the, our club team were playing a match across the road, I wouldn't necessarily have got it. Um, I went to see the championship final they won the year before. They were 12 points down um, at one stage at, at half time when they came back and won the game. So I knew that there was the makings of a team there, but I wanted to give them a hand. And the experience that I had in the first season was uh, I was addictive and working with them. We played a championship match against Banagher. The Derry Championships got a quarter final, a semi final, and a final. We played a quarter final against Banagher. We drew. The match went to replay. was level after normal time, after extra time. It was still a draw. We went to a second replay. We beat them by six points. <coughs> we went on to play Ballon Screen, the team that we played the previous year um, in the championship final. The match were losing by three points with two minutes to go. We made them score a goal with the level of the game. That was a draw. We went to a replay. We lost the replay. So we had five championship matches. All of them really high intensity. All of them, you know, with the players going absolutely flat out, going really, really hard, playing really well. Um, and all the time players were going off the summer holidays. We finished the season with about four or five players less than we started. And I knew from that, um, right, this is the, this is a serious business here. We also played against against the team in Derry. It was the most physical, dirty match I've ever been involved in in my life. 
I couldn't believe it. They beat the crap out of each other, two teams. I couldn't believe it. My perception of women's sport is kind of a genteel game that they kind of, you know, were nice to each other, totally exploded out the window. They were as, as physical and as aggressive and as committed and dedicated as any group of fellows that I've been involved with. In the team. Okay? So what happened then in 2009 is we, we were going well and we went to Dubai, uh, the Kamui team went to Dubai for a pre-season trip, for a brilliant time, we came back, things were going really well, people were talking about us in Derry, we won the first round match and then Lavi absolutely destroyed us in the Championship semi-final. So anybody here from Lavi? No. They destroyed us in the Championship semi-final and everybody was distraught and devastated and went away. And that winter I decided that I had to change after I was coaching. So in that winter, what I did that winter for myself changed the foundations of the way we ran the team and the way that I expected the girls to perform. I knew they were and I realised we had up the level, we had improved things across the board, okay? And I also realised that everything that you do is geared towards the match day. Everything you do. There's no point training and training and then on a match, big day, turning up and not performing or not delivering the goods. Everything is related to the match day. So when you're on the tight rope, Karen went in, there was a high wire rack. Eventually he died, he fell off the high wire and died. There was no uh, net underneath him, okay? Just picture what who he is. So the, the pinnacle of that was last year um, in Croke Park, our girls, that's then on the podium on the Hogan Steps. <coughs> Everybody talks about the Hogan Steps. I can visualise me and the on the Hogan Steps, lifting all out. And one week before the first year, I sent a text message with her speech on it, okay? And that's then the second that's the girls celebrating. So that's the pinnacle. Our achievement, Sean Paul McKellop here is coming. <coughs> Done a bit of coaching for us. Her achievement, Sean Paul agreed with us, was we won it once, but the real achievement was going back and won it the second time, two years in a row, okay? That is the achievement because it showed that the girls were prepared to rededicate themselves to the cause for a second time. So we talked then about the female athlete. Well, just, just watch this wee bit of footage. This is our team in the Ulster final in 2011. She kept going too. Um, there's skill there. Um, direct running, the ball's hitting right when you're a full back. Get, catches the ball, breaks the tackle, she comes out, she passes the ball down the wing. Megan Kerr comes out, takes it, he turns the girl, lifts the ball at pace, athleticism, control. She's got vision to see Brownie McGovern inside. She passes the ball inside, Brownie controls it. She's got the agility to sidestep the Valley Crown player and she scores. So to be, that's the characteristics of the female athlete there in that one clip from start to finish, you're talking about 45 seconds, whatever play it is, decision making. So, you just put it on again, right? Okay, so she's been coached not to foul in the tackle. The fellas are taught exactly the same thing. She doesn't foul her, she stands her up, stands her up, and then back and her, puts her out the back, and we're good going to play. Nothing wrong with the ball in. Lovely catch of the she breaks the tackle and leaves the guard. Ball down the wing, turn. Side step, and the score. Now, any coach, coach in Harlan, I think, would be pleased with the score they got. Okay? Um, <coughs> constructed there. I think the fact that the, the players are female is almost irrelevant. Do you agree? It's almost irrelevant. Okay. Performance skills at a high level under pressure and an also final situation with people watching, okay? Um, so you know you get a great bit of satisfaction from the coaching point of view watching a team that can go out and play like that and they won the game uh, and it was great. And you know, this year I was delighted to see Bonnie Cranwell in Ulster in the play in the All Ireland semi-final on Sunday week. 
and you know, we wish them all the best. We hope they win because they're a good club, they're good people, and they deserve their club to stay in the Croke Park from an Ulster point of view. But these things don't happen by accident, okay? So if you're a thinking coach, which is the thing here today, there's a number of things that I think you have to have in place. You need to plan what you're doing. You can't just turn up at um, you can't just turn up at training and you know run a session off the cuff. Well, you can, but you're liable to. You can't do it week in, week out. And I would say you even need to take it back before that. So what you need to do is you need to look at things like periodization, which is the fancy coaching term for planning your season. So you need to plan out your season from now right through to whatever it's going to end. Um, you need to be looking at different phases of training. You need to be looking at what you're going to do in your pre-season, your stamina work and so on, what you're going to do whenever you get into league matches. Um, do you do your pre-season work with the ball when you introduce the ball to it? Um, you know, in terms of the heavy slow in winter, you know, what sort of, uh, what way your training is calibrated? And I'm going to come on and talk a wee bit about the way that you calibrate training slightly differently for female players versus male players, because there is a difference in what you do in terms of intervals and recovery time and so on. Okay. You need to cover the basics in terms of skill. Um, preparedness to me is different from preparation. Preparedness is that feeling that you have in the game that you've done absolutely everything you could to play a match, that you couldn't do anything more, and that if you meet a team that beats you, the likelihood is that they've got you know better players or they're better prepared. But if you've done everything you can and you've done you've covered all the basics and your players are, are doing what you want them to do, then that's what I would classify as preparedness. The essentials then are, you know, basic stuff like basic skills. Um, in the case of Kimogi, you know, lifting, striking, catching, hooking, blocking, etc., etc. People here from the ladies' football, you know, even to you know, catch the ball, kick it, solo the ball, hand pass, etc. The essentials also include elements of, you know, tactical play, team play, support play, the use of space, etc., etc. The critical non-essentials. Um, these are things that, that we have put in place for the All-Ireland campaigns. These included feeding the players every night when the, after training. We fed them absolutely every night after training. The sandwiches, we were conscious that there was girls leaving jobs in Belfast to come down back home to Coleraine. Two years ago was during the first campaign. It was during that really, really bad winter. We trained on the beach a couple of times. It was about minus eight. The water was evaporating off the sea. It was all very mystical looking. But, you know, after that, we had like, you know, a cup of tea and sandwich for the players. So these are the critical non-essentials. We made sure we went to matches, we went on a decent bus, okay? We made sure that they got gear. We made sure that all these things were in place for them. And thanks to our club for doing that. The all Ireland campaign the first year cost about 12,000 pounds because, you know, you had to go and book hotels and buses. But we made sure that when the players turned up to train, they trained, they didn't have to worry about, you know, other bits and pieces. You know, in terms of Kimogi too, like, you know, I would want to have about 60 balls in place of the session, you know, about 60 minimum, so that, you know, when you're doing shooting drills, you're not having to slow down the drill or stop the drill for somebody going behind the goals to collect the balls. I don't know if other Kimogi coaches here would do that, but, you know, you need a load of balls, like, also football, you need footballs, like, you don't want to be, the guards aren't a training to run off and collect balls, you know, if a drill breaks down, it's not annoys me more than somebody hits the ball too hard, it gets miscontrolled. And you've got a, you know, you're running the thing for 30 seconds, and somebody spends 10 or 15 seconds chasing the ball off the field. Sure, there are balls there to do the, do the work. And the other thing is, you need to be able to empower the players. I'll come back to this later on, but I think it's very important that players are there and put on their say. So I'll ask them, okay? And as I said, these things don't happen by accident. We come up footage of a school in Croke Park. All head out into space, one of our players. Watch her take on the corner back. Okay. Now, what Megan Kerr's running to the table there is she's incredibly athletic. She's one of the fastest people in two feet I've ever seen. She's only just turned 18. She was played, played last year, though. She was 17. She was playing for party before she was 16. She's got the fastest feet in terms of turning in a, in a, in a close space. Um, so she's got a lot of the, the physical requirements that you want from a good player. Because she's a young player, we had a coach her in the play in particular positions. She's played <coughs> for us. She's played for us at half back, midfield, half forward, centre half forward, centre half back. And there you can see she scored two points in Croke Park, playing as part of a two-man full forward line, a two-woman full forward line. So she's 
We've worked on that. She's not able to do that by accident. We've worked on specifics of playing those positions. We've worked on drills and so on to enable her and empower her to actually play those positions. And again, we're going to come back to that later on. Now, the thinking player, if I'm a thinking coach, I want the players to think too. So what the thinking player, in my opinion, brings to the, brings to the dance is they're committed. You know, they drive down from Belfast uh, twice a week and, you know, minus three or four conditions. That's what they do because they're bought and know what they're doing. They um, put other things on hold. They, you know, they put off going up to hand parties. When you want things done, they're there. You know, that's the kind of commitment that they they bring to it. In terms of skill, you expect them to have um, the skill that we give them in training. It would be very common for players to come to my house and borrow balls, go to the pitch, and work on their own time. There's a couple of them in particular really improved themselves by the work that they've done on their own. I would rely on them to be committed to fitness and conditioning, and this is Mickey McCullough and Kevin were talking upstairs. To me, the female athlete is far is capable of far more fitness and conditioning work than coaches will put them to. Okay, girls are able to work far, far harder than people think they can, to the point of absolute exhaustion. The only thing is um, that when you're working with female athletes, in my opinion, you need to recalibrate what you're doing by a factor of about 10, 15 to 20 percent less than you would do with a hurling team. So what I mean by that is if you're running a drill that with football, say a high intensity drill, you want to knock maybe five seconds off it. I've seen it in 45 seconds or 40 second intervals. You want to knock maybe five or seven or 10 seconds off it working with a girls team than a fellas team. And the data shows that in, in world records, Women's world records in equivalent distances are usually about 10% less than men, so the world 100 metres, women are about 10% not as fast. They're not slower, they're still faster than anyone in this room. But um, there's a factor of about 10% there. So your fitness and conditioning, you have to make sure that's calibrated to the right level for dealing with girls and training. And that applies whether it's ladies football or, or camogie, it doesn't matter. Okay? If you want to build confidence in them, the, the biggest uh, issues that I think involved with uh, girls and team situations are two things, decision making and tactical awareness. Decision making is that split second on the pitch when you get the ball and you decide what happens next. And your training session should be full of drills and exercises that um, you know, rely on players to make decisions. And I'm talking about whatever sport it is, you know. I mean, whenever, you know, we, we play spiders when they're under eight, so like, you know, where they have to dodge and get past, try to get to one end at all. I watched my daughter doing it last night, she's six. You know, the decisions she was making, you know, to run backwards and go right and left. You know, even in a weak game like that, there's decisions to be made. But decision making in a pitch situation is very important. You see in those cups I showed you where, um, you know, the ball's hit on the space. There's a certain amount of decision making and tactical awareness there. Megan got the ball. She's done like slightly to go one way and around another, around another corner. Okay. Um, perspective is the awareness that there's other things going on outside their lives, and you need to be aware of that too. In our squad, there's girls aged from 15 to 42. So a 15-year-old girl doing you know, AS levels or old level or GCSEs, or whatever they are nowadays, has got a different set of pressures in their life than a woman of 42 who's got three children, and one of whom is maybe doing the 11 plus or whatever. Um, the time that, that two years ago when we were preparing to go to Crook Park, our goalkeeper, Helene, who's 42, her father died on the Monday before the game. Okay, and um, we're very close to that squad. The entire squad was at our father's funeral, and there was a minute of silence for him in Croke Park. It was a very, very emotional time. Some of the girls that helped her get through that were 15, 16, 17 year olds. Okay, driving into Croke Park, one of the 17 year olds just burst into tears and went and sat down beside uh, one of the other players. It wasn't until the day of the game that she realised the enormity of what she was about to do. This is one of our start 15. Okay, so. You need to be conscious of dealing with girls that there are there are slightly different issues. I'm conscious of a lot of girls in the room here, but for male coaches dealing with that, there are different issues and softer skills that are involved in coaching a female athlete. So I was sorry, what's your name? Your name? Kira. Kira. I was talking to Kira before you come in here. What I think a coach should do, in one aspect it shouldn't matter whether you're coaching girls or fellas, you should be civil and decent to the person you're dealing with. If I say to you, Sorry, in the match in next week, you're not, you're not starting, and the reason you're not starting is because I think in that position there's somebody better to play for this particular game, but you're probably coming in as a sub, okay? Fair enough. Rather than call out the list on the team, and this person here has been playing all year, hasn't been told that. 
Okay, I would do that. I'm involved with the University of Hurling team. I took a lot off after 10 months. We're playing UCD there a while ago. Supposed to be their, sec their third team. They brought up a seconds team of five Kilkenny over 21s and beat the shit out of us. Okay, and one of our cornerbacks was getting destroyed by this fella, Kilkenny fella. We took him off after 10 minutes and I said, The reason I took you off is because I don't want your confidence being destroyed by Mark and the fella. This is a fella who plays for a team in Belfast, junior club in Belfast, in Antrim. That's the point of Antrim. You know, why do you see me do that? You know what I mean? So, in terms of table players, what a common civil decency, okay? Enthusiasm, you get that in spades. And the match experience of what they do in a given situation, that relates back to the uh, decision making. But here's another clip, similar thing. Think it on the pitch, ball down. Most of you probably heard of Grace McBone. There's not many people in the country who can play this pass. Round the corner, it takes out two players. That's Ronnie McGovern going through onto the ball. If you hear, if, you probably can't hear it there, but what you can hear in that bit of tape is Grania shouting to Grace, shouting twice, Grace, Grace, because she knew that of all the players in that pitch, whether they were from Galway or Derry or wherever, that Grace was the one player to turn and put that ball back into that space for her to run onto. And if Ethel Linsky hadn't have found her, Grania would score a goal, I would say, but she got another point. Okay, but that's like it on the pitch. Both Grace and Ron getting the ball and Grania would make the run. Okay, so close to the female athlete. What is the difference? Well, as I said, recalibrating the level of physicality and what you're doing, um, dealing with them on a more personal level and being aware of what they're, what, what's going on. You know. But the other point about that is, I think you should be doing that with anybody that you're coaching with, because they come along to you. There may be reasons that they can't go to training. There may be reasons that they can't do something. You've got to be aware of that, especially if they're, they're in a situation where they have children or, you know, they're really caring for somebody. You've got to be conscious of that. And if you're not, you know, the fact is that fellas go out to play sport, lift the bag and go out the door. But in any household, usually the mother is the, the person who's looking after the kids. So she can't maybe just lift the bag and head out the door. She's the one who's probably organised the child mining. Or maybe there's two or three kids standing around the side of the pitch. <coughs> you know? So you need to be, you know, that raises issues too, make sure they the ball. The commitment's the same as fellas. The competitiveness is the same. Uh, the will to win is the same. In fact, it can be, you know, could be, could be uh, possibly stronger, I would say, at times. Determination, the club of the fitness, the pain threshold. Um, you know, I've seen the girls, some of the slaps that female camogie players, or camogie players get in matches, the bruises. You know, when you see them, we would go out as a team from time to time. Girls go out, they spend about three hours getting dressed up before they go out. You know, you have to allow enough time for them to get home and construct the whole, you know, <laughs> but you see them going out and there's a, a short sleeve t shirt or something, and there's a boss of a hurling, hurling stick here, and you know, a big slap on the knee and a slap on the leg. And, you know, I've seen fellas stand them in the bar, like, what do you do? What do you do? Where did you get that? <laughs> and they're quite like the movie. Right, so the other thing is recognition. Um, the female sports does not get the recognition. The dairy team there at the moment, we have a few lads in the dairy team. There's an issue with the dairy team at the moment. The right family team is out of school. The 45 in the panel, the dairy football team, the 45 in the panel, they couldn't pay any expenses over the winter. I don't know they were training legitimately. They weren't breaking any training ban. The dairy team couldn't pay any expenses. Eventually they came to a negotiated settlement through the GPA that they would get, you know, the 45, 30 players expenses divided amongst 45. And this was going on. And uh, some of our lads in the club were saying, oh, we can get any expenses. And Grania and McGovern and Mabel, we've been in the dairy team for about 15 years, said, we never get any expenses. We never get any expenses. They also look at the comments in the newspapers. They don't get covered, you know, um, on, on you know, the Sunday game as much. There's no live coverage of matches. To be fair, ladies football, the coverage is probably better. But by and large, female athletes do not get the recognition they deserve. And they deserve it because they don't do any less work than the fellas, okay? Now, some misconceptions about the game of hurling or camogie, I'm not talking about ladies' football here, that camogie is the same as hurling. Females are hard to coach. Some people would say this, they've got that camogie and got working on women, just they must be hard to coach, eh? You know, um, they can't do the physical work. You know, well, I wear pink lycra and I'm quite hurt myself. One of our players' parents one night wouldn't let her train in the winter. She says, I will let you go to training when Joe treats you like girls instead of fellas. And my answer was, tell your mother, if I treat you like girls instead of fellas, you will not win anything. You do the same sort of training as the boys would be doing, except 
you know, you're at the right level for you. But this idea that, you know, there's something unfeminine about doing this work. Balls, if you set it out there, if you set out the cones and you set out the work and you say, Gerard, you're going to do that, they'll do it. They'll do it, I'll tell you. I know that for a fact. And I know for a fact too, they will do stuff, and I set it upstairs, they will do stuff away, above, and beyond anything that you think they might be able to do. There's times that um, we have done stuff, particularly in, in um, you know, physical training, coming into these all iron campaigns, we go to play southern teams and bobby pitches. Some of the training stuff we have done has been brutal in really bad weather, okay? But they've done it, and they haven't complained, and they get on it. And if our 24 or 26 or 30 players can do it, so can yours. There's no reason why they can't. But you've got to present to them, if you do this, this is what is likely to happen next. Okay, you'll win something. Maybe the junior championship, maybe the league, something. It might be that you get the semi final when we got to the quarter final last year, but you will see results because they'll be prepared to do the work, okay? But they're soft on the pitch, mentally fragile. That is all rubbish, okay? I don't agree with that yet. Kimobi isn't the same game as Harlem. I'm saying this to Liam on the way down here. The skill set's the same as Harlem, okay? There's a lot of things about Kimobi that's the same as Harlem, but in some ways, it's more akin to Gaelic football. The ball doesn't fly up the pitch as much as it would in Hurling. It's very rare that you would see a cornerback landing the ball on top of, you know, somewhere between the half forward line and the full forward line. So, you know, a lot of girls striking is not as powerful as men striking. That's a fact. When they strike the ball, the ball doesn't go as far. There's some remarkable strikers of a slitter in Ulster. You know, Catherine McGurdy, uh, Fanella Carr, Grania McGoldrick. You know, some of these players, when they had a ball, they hit it as far as any fellas. But there's a lot of players that don't have the same length and distance. So what happens in Kimogi is that, you know, you need to remember that Kimogi is a slightly different game than Hurley. Yes, the skills are the same. There's a lot more broken play. The ball's on the ground a lot more. Now, maybe somebody will do video analysis and prove me wrong on this. But Sean Paul, what do you think? It's on the ground a lot more. And there's not as much aerial dominance, you know. All right? You know, there's some community teams you see them that can catch the ball really well. I don't know what ladies football, I'm not as familiar with ladies football, although we watch it. But the ability to catch the ball isn't as strong in Kimobi as it would be in Hurling above the head. Some clubs you see they're very, very good at, some players are exceptional. <coughs> uh, you know, but some of them, there's a couple of girls, the clubs in, um, in Derry, they're obviously brilliant in, in the air. Okay, and that they're mentally fragile. Don't agree with that at all. Okay, coaching issues. I would say as a coach, you need to get to know your players, you know. And then also, you need to, you need to ask some questions about what you're doing um, in terms of the way you set up your team. So, for example, do you need six forwards on the pitch? If you could put six forwards, this applies to any, any sort of game music. If you have six forwards on the pitch, one's a very good player, but they never score. Well, they need to look at that. What do they contribute to your forward? And you better bring them out the pitch. You know, think about things a wee bit differently. Do you select a team that never has played together? This happens in senior county football teams and hurling teams. You see a team named the Championship and they never play together. They never play together as that unit with the same people either side of them or in front and behind. How can you do that? How can you do that? If you're working on systems of play, unless you've got a very, very well tuned up team, how are you going to know what to do in any particular situation? Is the player capable of playing a given position? Has she been coached on it for make the job description? Now, 